All right. Thanks for being here and letting me speak. Um, I'm really excited about this presentation. Um, we're going to be talking about a social revolution that's taking place right now in Western Kurdistan, which is northern Syria along the border with Turkey. It's a revolution of a really unique character, and I became interested in it about six or seven months ago when I saw a article from David Graeber in The Guardian pop up my newsfeed entitled, Why is the World Ignoring the Revolutionary Kurds in Syria? And I was completely unaware of anything that was going on there. And he starts the article talking about his father who fought in the Spanish Revolutionary War. Uh-oh, what happened? I lost my slides. Okay, I'll keep talking for a second. Um, he he starts talking about his father who fought in revolutionary Spain with the anarchists against the fascists. And he draws a general outline of what the situation was there. Oh, it's just a screensaver. Shit. Okay. Um, so he, he creates that overview of Spain and he uh, makes comparisons to the situation today in Rojava. He points out that uh, both are facing fascist forces, both are fighting for their lives. Um, a lot of their political c characters are similar. And the workplaces have been collectivized. They rely on uh, direct democracy. Um, the liberation of women is at the center of the struggle. And that really fascinated me because I'm, most of my politics are informed by anarchism. And uh, Spain is often seen as a high watermark in the anarchist movement. And they also, he also said that they take inspiration from the Zapatistas of Mexico, who, which is another revolution that I have a uh, great interest in. So that really ignited my curiosity in, in the subject. I started trying to learn more about it, gather information, try to find a good source where I could get a broad overview of the situation there. And I found that doesn't really exist yet. I had to pull from lots and lots of different sources to put together a complete picture of what's happening there. Um, so I broke this down into, I think, five sections. Uh, first, we're going to talk about general history of the Kurds with a special emphasis on the history of the PKK, Kurdistani Workers' Party, and their leader, Abdullah Ocalan. Uh, second, we'll be talking about Murray Bookchin um, and his influence on the revolution there. Then talking about the political structure, followed by the economic structural structure and the war on ISIS and al-Nusra. All right, so before researching this, I knew almost nothing about the Kurds. I knew they were an ethnic group. I knew they were one of the sectarian elements in Iraq. I knew that Saddam had committed some atrocity against them in the 80s. Beyond that, I really knew almost nothing. Um, but who the Kurds are, they're one of the indigenous peoples of the Mesopotamian Plains and the highlands in what are now southeastern Turkey, northeastern Syria, northern Iraq, northwestern Iran, and western Armenia. So they cover a number of different nation states. There's currently 15 to 35 million Kurds in Kurdistan, about 40 million worldwide. Um, it's a pretty large range. I think 25 million is probably a safe number. They make up the fourth largest ethnic group in the Middle East, and they are the largest ethnic group in the world without an independent state of their own. They make up 15 20% of the population of Turkey, 9 15% of Syria, 15 20% of Iraq. And I didn't write it down, but I think it's like 10% of Iran. Uh, most Kurds today are Sunni Muslims, but 
the Kurds existed before Islam and they were resistant to the military expansion of Islam in the 6th century. Um, so they've been without a state for 1400 years and they've been consistently resistant to their occupiers. Um, it's too broad of a history to go into in a lot of depth, but I do want to talk about some of the modern uh, repression of the Kurds at the hands of the states that they live in. Um, Kurd, uh, the Kurds have received a harsh treatment at the hands of Turkish authorities for generations. In response to uprisings in, in the 1920s and 30s, many Kurds were resettled. Kurdish names and costumes were banned. The use of the Kurdish language in public or private, written or spoken, was banned. They couldn't speak their own language. And uh, the the Turkish state tried to erase their actual ethnic identity, uh, referring to them as mountain Turks. Uh, they also uh, destroyed villages, uh, political parties of Kurds have been banned, leaders have been imprisoned, and that's just Turkey, uh, but every state they live under has been equally oppressive. Syria, for example, um, bans them from many professions, they're not allowed to own property in many cases, they refuse admission to universities. Let me see here. The, the Syrian government didn't even acknowledge the existence of the Kurds in Syria, and Kurds were stripped of their citizenship in 1962 uh, when they were registered as foreigners because their ancestors weren't included in the Ottoman population registers for 1920. Um, the language and culture there has been suppressed as well. Um, things got a little better during the uprising of 2011. Well, it didn't really get better, but the uh, Syria relaxed some of its anti-Kurdish laws. Uh, but still, only 6,000 of, of the 150,000 stateless Kurds have been given nationality. And a lot of the bans on like teaching the Kurdish language are still on the books. So. The specific area we're going to be looking at, Rojava, is along here, the Syrian border. I'll show you the current state of it now. So, currently the Kurds are battling ISIS and Al Nusra, which is the dark area here. They would like to control all this area if they were to push out all the oppressive forces. But currently, they're divided into three separate non-contiguous cantons. On the west, you have Efren or Afrin. In the center, you have Kobani. And on the east, you have uh, Sezira, I think is the Kurdish word. Uh, it's uh, often referred to as uh, Jazira. So, most of the people in Rojava are Kurdish, uh, but there are uh, large Arab settlements, especially in Jazira. Most of the people in um, a couple of the towns in Jazira are Assyrian. There's also Yazidis, Armenians, Turkmen, and Chechens, uh, among other ethnic groups. Uh, most of the people in the region are Muslim, but some are Christian and as well as Zoroastrians, Yazidis, um, other smaller religions. Uh, there's been a uh, extreme effort to um, create religious freedom in the area, although we'll be getting to that later. Uh, so main languages are Kurdish, Aramaic, and Syrian Armenic. Oh, sorry, Syrian Armenic. Let's see. So, let's talk a little bit about the ancient history of the Kurds. Again, they're indigenous to the area, conquered by the Arabs in 633, I believe. Um, and afterward, they were conquered by the Seljuk Turks, the Mongols, and the Safavid dynasty, and beginning in the 1200s, the Ottoman Empire. Now, in. Oh, Historic engravings there. Now, the Ottoman Empire fell at the end of World War I, and to the, 
to the victor goes the spoils, the Western imperialist powers got to carve up the region in their own interests. Um, the first step of that was the Treaty of, Sever Treaty of Severus, in which the Kurds were promised a homeland of their own. It formed the countries of Iraq, Syria, and Kuwait, um, but Turkey, Iran, Iran, Iraq, and Syria refused to recognize Kurdish independence. Ultimately, that treaty was rejected, but it was followed up in 1923 by the Treaty of Lausanne. And in this one, they, there wasn't even a place for the Kurds at all. Turkey was not obligated to grant Kurdish, uh, uh, Kurdish autonomy. And the region was split up between Ira Turkey, Iraq, and Syria. Now, in the 1920s and 30s, 1925, 1930, and 1936 to 38, there were large uh, Kurdish revolts in Turkey after this treaty. Uh, that's what led to a lot of the official state repression of their culture. In 1946, the Kurds were able to set up a republic in Iran, the, Ma the Mahabad Republic, with Soviet backing. It was crushed after a little over a year by the Iranians. Same year, the KDP is formed. They're a political party that would go on to um, be the ruling power in the autonomous Kurdish region in Iraq. In 1963, the Kurds in northern Iraq revolted against the government. Uh, the uprising was put down, but the fighting continued for decades. Although in 1970, a, a peace agreement was signed they gave the Kurds in northern Iraq some self-rule. In 1974, the KDP attacked the Iraqi government after they refused to grant them control over Kirkuk. In 1975, the KDP split and one of the leaders created the Patriotic Union, Patriotic Union of Kurdistan. And those two groups had decades of conflict. 1979, the Iranian Revolution leads to another Kurdish uprising that is suppressed. And now we get to the central figures in our story. The Kurdistani Workers' Party and their leader, Abdullah Ocalan. He was a political science student back in the early 70s. And he started forming these uh, radical revolutionary groups to fight for Kurdish independence. Ultimately, in 1978, PKK was formed. You can see that picture is actually from 1982 with Ocalan sitting in the background there. They were founded as a staunch Marxist-Leninist party. Their goal was to overthrow the Turkish state and establish a socialist state there. For the first few years of life, first like six years of life, they mostly concentrated on fighting other Kurdish groups. Um, one thing about this story is when, if I say the Kurdish people take it with a grain of salt because you can't really speak for the entire people at all. There's many, many, many different fa factions who have united under all kinds of different ideologies from Marxism to anarchism to capitalism to Islamism. So there's been a lot of conflict between those groups. Uh, the first action actually was in 1979 as an act of prop, uh, propaganda by the D, they tried to assassinate a Kurdish tribal leader that they claimed was exploiting the peasants and collaborating with Turkey. Um, and this started a period of intense urban warfare. Now, in 1980, you have the Turkish coup. Oh, actually, I wanted to say, um, between 78 and 82, the Turkish Security Council reported 43,000 incidents it described as terrorism, and the total death toll in the 70s is estimated at 5,000, with nearly 10 assassinations a day. So in 1980, the uh, there's a Turkish coup, and it pushes the PKK to another stage. Um, there's a lot of repression, uh, leaders doing jail time, being killed by the state, um, fleeing to Syria. In 1980, the PKK bombed the Turkish consulate in France, in a joint operation with the Radical Armenian Group. But in 1984, they launched the first paramilitary phrase. So they, they developed into 
an actual military body that was going to go to war against the Turkish state. And this would last for 30 years until 2014. Um, so thousands of Kurds in southeast Turkey joined their cause, fueled by dissatisfaction with the living conditions. It launched attacks and bombings against government installations, military, and various institutions of the state. It became less centralized and took up operations in a variety of European and Middle Eastern countries, especially Germany and France. Um, it ended up uh, actually setting up training camps in France. And the PKK began attacking civilian and military targets in various countries. Um, eventually, over the course of this whole 30-year war, 40,000 people would be killed and hundreds of thousands would be displaced. Now, in, from 1982 onward, you have, oh, we're going to get to that in a minute. 1982 onward, you have the Iran-Iraq War, which changes things for the Kurds. It, um, the PKK starts setting up bases in northern Iraq. Um, and they use this to develop cross-border attacks with Iraq. The relationships between the PKK and the KDP were strained because the KDP, again, the ruling party in northern Iraq, or uh, pro-capitalist, pro-West, um, PKK is Marxist-Leninist, uh, but they did allow them to set up bases and to carry out attacks on Turkey. And the PKK at this point had two routes of penetration into Turkey, from Syria and from Iraq. The Turkish state started these hot, hot pursuit um, campaigns against the PKK, and the cross-border incidents were achieved with the approval of Saddam Hussein. Now, in the Kurds during this time sided with Iran in the Iraq-Iran war. In retaliation, Saddam Hussein became uh, began a genocidal campaign against them called the An oh, Al Anfal campaign. Um, it resulted in the destruction of 4,500 er, 4, villages and killed between 50,000 and 182,000 civilians. Uh, one of the worst incidents in the whole campaign was the uh, Halal Jab, I'm sorry, I'm terrible with these pronunciations, chemical attack, which killed between 3,200 and 5,000 Kurds and injured between 7 and 10,000 using mustard gas, nerve agents, the blood agent, hydrogen cyanide, as well as conventional rocket and napalm attacks. And it was and still remains the largest chemical weapons attack directed against the civilian population in history. Uh, in 1991, is further development with the uh, Gulf War. The Kurds rose up, encouraged by the United States. Iraq quashes the rebellion, killing thousands, and the UN coalition forces did not come to the aid of the Turks. They did eventually establish a no-fly zone, which uh, allowed for that autonomous region in North Iraq. In, during this period, the PKK reached an all-time uh, highest operating activity. Turkey opens its border to Iraqi refugees, which allowed them to move more freely into Turkey. It undermined Baghdad's control over the Kurds and a power vacuum was created north of the 36th parallel. So, let's see, did I skip the part? Well, let's see. All right, 93, 95, you have the second paramilitary phase. Um, Turkey was realizing that it was impossible to defeat the PKK as long as it could retreat into neighboring countries. The PKK's revenues at this time were estimated at 20 to 50 million, uh, sorry, 200 to 500 million US dollars annually. Um, the major bulk of that was uh, state sponsorship, but also drug dealing, uh, drug trafficking, mostly heroin. 10% um, of the income, 10 percent of Turkey's income was spent on fighting the PKK. In one year alone, the Turkish government sp spent eight billion dollars on fighting them with no real result. In 1993, the Kurds put an end to uh, the tensions between them and other Kurdish groups with an alliance with the Kurdish Socialist Party. After that, 30 percent of the captured or killed PKK members were Syrian nationals of Armenian origin or other Syrians. So I should organize this better. 
So there, was, there, there continued to be um, huge attacks on the PKK from Turkey. In 1992, they sent in 35,000 troops. In 1997, the Iraqi Kurdish War took place between rival Kurdish factions. It drew factions from Iran, Turkey, as well as Iranian, Iraqi, and American forces into the fighting. And the PKK began attacking ethnic uh, Assyrians and civilians who supported the KDP. The third military phase was 96 to 99. At this time, they um, abandoned their attacks on Kurdish civilians and concentrated entirely on the government. Um, there was a hunger strike for members in his jails who were being mistreated. Around this time, uh, Osalan starts to express doubts about his strategy up to this point. He actually told a, in a satellite TV interview, he said that some of his militants are no better than murderers. Um, so this period ended in 1999 when Osalan was captured. He was abducted in Kenya. He had been traveling between various countries, mostly through Europe, avoiding extradition. But eventually, with the help of American intelligence, he was captured. From 1998 to 1999, the PKK began a campaign of suicide bombings, uh, which there were 14 incidents altogether. The targets were carefully selected, and the bombers were selected from among the KDP's leadership. Or, sorry, PKK's leadership. Oops. Hold on a minute. So, after Osalan was captured, he began to reassess his, his tactics and his group's efforts. He started reading a lot of post-Marxist uh, post work and looking for a new framework to fight for Kurdish independence under. Where did I put that? So he embarked on a thorough re-examination of self-criticism and terrible violence, dogmatism, personality cult, and authoritarianism that he had fostered. He said, quote, It has become clear that our theory, program, and practices of the 1970s produced nothing but feudal separatism and violence, and even worse, the nationalism that we should have opposed infested us all. Even though we opposed it in principle and rhetoric, we nonetheless accepted it as inevitable. He said that dogmatism is nurtured by abstract truths, which become habitual ways of thinking. As soon as you put general truths into words, you feel like a high priest in the service of God. That was the mistake I made. So at this time, he's, he's casting about for different ideologies, different um, ways to move forward. And eventually, he comes across the work of Murray Bookchin, um, especially this book, Ecology of Freedom and Urbanization Without Cities. So let's talk about Bookchin for a bit. He was born in 1921 in New York, raised in the Bronx. His parents were Russian Jewish immigrants. Both were Marxists, as well as his grandmother, who endued him with populist ideas from the uh, uh, social revolution. In 1930, he joined the Young Pioneers, a uh, communist youth, youth organization for children 9 to 14, and later the Communist Youth Young Communist League. He attended the workers' school near Union Square where he started Marxism, but in 1935 he became disillusioned by Stalin's shift of international communism to the less militant popular fr front party line. Deeply involved in organizing activities around the Spanish Civil War, in which he was too young to participate, he remained with the communists until the Stalin-Hitler Pact of September 1939, when he was expelled for Trotskyist anarchist deviations. He subsequently broke with, with Stalinism and gravitated towards Trotskyism joining the Social Workers' Party. In the 1940s, he worked in a foundry in New Jersey where he was a union uh, steward and organizer. Um, he became a recruiter for the SWP. He became active in uh, labor organizing the CIO. He was later an auto, auto worker in a UAW member during the time of the General Motors strike of 1945 to 1946. At that time, he was becoming um, disenchanted with Trotskyism and um, 
disappointed with uh, what he saw as their traditional Bolshevik authoritarianism. He began to question his traditional co concepts around the he hegemonic or vanguard role of the industrial working class. But rather than giving up on his uh, revolutionary pursuits, he decided to uh, look for another framework. Uh, at the time, the Trotskyists thought that World War II was going to end in the, um, with social revolutions in Europe and America. And when that didn't happen, Bookchin abandoned Trotskyism. Uh, he worked for a time writing for a paper with other post-Trotskyists and started developing theories around ecology, which is one of his major contributions to radical thought. He developed this theory of social ecology that put environmental problems, or found the root of environmental problems in social problems. He was a real pioneer in the environmentalist and ecological movement. His first book on the subject, um, Our Synthetic Environment, I think, um, predated Rachel Carlson's Silent Spring. He founded the Libertarian League in the 1950s in New York, and by 1958 he identified himself as an anarchist. Uh, thereafter, he'd probably be the most prominent and controversial anarchist writer of the latter half of the 20th century. So around this time, he came to embrace the tradition of Peter Kropotkin. He wrote a number of influential essays in the 60s, Ecology and Revolutionary Thought, which was the first to call on a radical political ecology, attempting to marry ecology and anarchism. He wrote Towards a Liberatory Technology about alternative sources of energy, Listen Marxist, which was a warning to the SDS about impending takeover and a critique of Marxist-Leninism. And he continued to work a series of manual labor jobs while doing this. In 1971, he wrote Post-Scarcity Post Anarchism, which is a collection of those essays. And at the same year, he found the Institute for Social Ecology at Goddard College in Vermont, where he taught until 2004. Uh, he published the Spanish Anarchist in 1977, History of the of Revolutionary Spain. In the 1980s, he wrote uh, this book, The Ecology of Freedom. Uh, the original subtitle was The Where to Go? The Emergence and Dis Disillusion of Hierarchy. And it weaves together political, anthropological, psychological, and scientific themes. So one of his uh, great contributions is broadening the anarchists aim from the, the classical anarchists who aim mostly at uh, the church, state, and capitalism, and broaden that into all hierarchies, whether formal or informal, including racism, sexism, uh, uh, heteronormality, ableism, all the rest. And so those all being systems of dominance and subordination. Now, um, one of the, the interesting aspects of his life is that the, the more he wrote, the further at odds he got with the anarchist movement. He believed in the aims, but he thought the culture was going nowhere. He tried his whole life to uh, revi revive the anarchist movement in America to no avail. Um, he felt that the, a new generation of anti-capitalists were focusing more on personal rebellion than social action, which he thought was a retreat in the bourgeois self-absorption that absolved anarchists from the responsibility to enact change. And he became really opposed to a lot of the movements he inspired, including uh, deep green ecology, um, <coughs> which I could talk about, but it's not important to this. Um, so his second most important book was The Rise of Urbanization and the Decline of Citizenship or Urbanization Without Cities. It, in it, he traces the development of hierarchy and the responses to it. Uh, in the closing chapter, he 
lays out his political theory, which he called libertarian municipalism, which is a politics that seeks to create a vital local political or civic sphere in order to establish direct democratic popular assemblies at the municipal town and neighborhood levels. Over larger regions, these assemblies would confederate and as they gained strength, challenge the centralized nation state. In uh, 1995, he published Social Anarchism or Lifestyle Anarchism, an unbridgeable chasm. He was the guy that coined that term, lifestyle anarchist, and um, which drove an even deeper wedge between himself and the anar anarchist community. By 1999, he was disengaging from anarchism, and in 2002, he rejected anarchism altogether in favor of communalism. Uh, he died in 2006, and was shortly um, before that, in 2004, Ocelon, through his lawyers, got in contact with him. He told Murray that he, Ocelon, considered himself Bookchin's student, and he acquired a good understanding of his work and was eager to make the ideas applicable to Middle Eastern societies. He asked for a dialogue, but Murray was too sick that age and had to decline. When he died in 2006, the PKK released a statement calling him uh, the greatest social scientist of the 20th century. In, so in 2004, uh, Ocelon started recommending urbanization without cities to all the mayors in Kurdistan and ecology of freedom to all militants. In 2005, he wrote that the democratization of the state is out of place, that he concluded that the state was a mechanism of oppression the organizational form of the ruling class, and as such, one of the most dangerous phenomena in history. It's toxic to the democratic project, a disease, and while it's around, we will not be able to create a democratic system. So Kurds and their sympathizers must never focus our efforts on this state or becoming a state, because that would mean losing the democracy and playing it in the hands of the capitalist system. In 2005, Ocelon um, released the Declaration of Democratic Confederalism, which he called on all uh, PKK affiliated parties to be in putting this practice into action. But it wasn't until uh, after 2011 and the Syrian uprising that there was a space in Western Kurdistan or Rojava, Rojava means Western in Kurdish, uh, that could be put into practice. So that began in 2012 and 2013. How it works is there's assemblies. It was basically four, four, layer, four layers to the government structure. There's the level of the communes, the level of districts, cities, and cantons. So at the level of the commune, there's groups of about 300 people uh, who all live in a given area together. And they have popular assemblies where they get together and decide how their neighborhood is going to be run. And when there's decisions that need to be coordinated over a larger area, these assemblies elect delegates who are not representatives because they don't make decisions on their own. They only do the will of the people and they are instantly recallable if they don't. Um, I've got some quotes here from Osgur Ahmed, a Kurdish journalist, about how this is being put in practice. He says, In Rojava, decision-making is via popular assemblies and multicultural and multi-religious. The top three officers in each municipality are Kurd and Arab and Assyrian, or Armenian Christian, and at least one of these three must be a woman. Non-Kurd minorities have their own institutions and speak their own language. Administration is conducted for and by organizations and assemblies chosen by elections. No government can remain outside or above the social contract established by the administration of democratic autonomy and be considered legitimate. No body which acts by itself or in the interest of a single group is acceptable. What exists in Rojava is foremost a form of political autonomy. Political autonomy here means fundamentally the transfer of executive and legislative powers in a constitutional and participatory manner from the central state to regional bodies chosen democratically in a manner which sufficiently protects cultural and ethnic minorities living in the traditional home homelands. Now, um, a lot of good information I got this 
on this was from uh, Janet Beal, who was Bookchin's partner. Uh, she was one of those, uh, part of a uh, academic delegation who traveled there. Uh, David Graeber was also part of that. And they got to see how this, all this was being put into action. In her, her um, interview with Sinar Sila of uh, Tevdem, he says that our system rests on the communes made up of neighborhoods of 300 people. The communes have co-presidents, and there are co-presidents from all levels, from commune to canton administration. In each commune, there are five or six different committees. These committees can be health committees, education committees, security committees. Um, Let's see. She asks um, about the tensions between decisions from below and decisions from above. For example, um, big infrastructure projects, if you need to create a mill or an oil refinery, how do you do that from the, from the bottom up, from the neighborhood level? And he, he breaks down um, the situation in one of the cities in Camislo. He says Camislo has six different districts. Each district has 18 communes, and each commune is made up of 300 people. Now, each commune has two elected co-presidents, and each commune has, di has different committees. The two elected co-presidents co from each commune come together to make up the People's Council of that district. Then each of these six district People's Councils elect two co-presidents. So from Camillo six districts, t 12 people make up the citywide People's Council, but 12 people alone can't make up the council. It's supposed to have 200. So in addition to these 12 peoples, the others are elected directly. If, even if you're not on a committee or weren't selected in the commune, you can put your name out and potentially be elected. In uh, Zira, Canton consists of 12 cities. Delegates to the Canton Levels People's Council are allocated according to population. Each city's people, People's Council elects who's going to the Canton-wide People's Council. So it's um, people at the bottom have a direct relationship with um, every level of organizing. Now, one of the, the really exciting parts of this, I was, originally I was gonna have like a, a section on women's liberation, but it's so tied into everything in the revolution that I couldn't do a single section on it. Um, this is an example of a, a women's council. And a women's council exists parallel to every single democratic institution in Rojava from the level of the commune to the level of the canton, and even the transnational organizations, have a women's council. And they rule on issues that have a special interest to women, um, and they get to decide what those issues are. If a popular committee is debating something and makes a decision that is that the Women's councils don't like, they have total veto power at every level. They can veto anything that's passed by the popular assemblies. So there's, there's the 40% women's quota in, in um, popular councils, but that exists parallel to the women's councils. And they, they do rule on everything, including uh, criminal proceedings, which follows the model of uh, restorative justice in Rojava. All right, so I want to read a bit from Oslan's Declaration of Democratic Confederalism. I won't go through the, the whole thing, just some highlights from uh, the seven points that he puts at the beginning. He says, the system of nation states has become a serious barrier to the development of society and democracy and freedom since the end of the 20th century. The model of the United Nations based on nation states is not working. The nation state is an obstacle to its development. The only way out of this situation is to establish democratic and federal system that will derive its strength directly from the people, not from globalization based on nation states. Here is the communities who talk, debate, and make decisions. From the base to the top, the elected delegates would form a kind of loose coordinating body. The system of democratic confederalism would be the model for the 
uh, resolution of the problems in the Middle East. Democratic confederalism is a system which takes into consideration the religious, ethnic, and class differences in society. A Kurdish structure will develop through the creation of a federation of Kurds in Iraq, Turkey, Syria, and Iran. And by uniting on a higher level, they will form a confederal system. Within Kurdistan, democratic communities will establish villages, towns, and city assemblies, and their delegates will be entrusted with the real decision-making, which in effect means that the people and the community will decide. He concluded that uh, to develop and establish democratic confederalism is a historical, um, unavoidable historical duty. And that democratic confederalism is, again, a non-state system, but a democratic system of the people without a state, with the women and youth at the forefront. We see, um, so that's basically the political structure. The economic structure is a lot more messy because of the situation they're facing. First, the all areas in Rojava are um, under a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not embargo. There we go. Nothing can come in or out. They're completely surrounded by hostile forces on all sides, ISIS to the south and Turkey to the north. Um, there's very little infrastructure in Rojava. And so they're really on a survival basis. Now, in, with the Syrian uprising in 2011, they were able to take control of the areas without a lot of conflict because the Syrian armed forces were fleeing along with the bourgeoisie. And everything that was left behind was collectivized. And so the, the, they're trying to make the cooperative the center of their economic system. So they're trying to build trade cooperatives, company cooperatives, and construction cooperatives. Uh, I'm reading here from an interview with one of the, oh, um, Abdurrahman Hemo, advisor for economic development. So he says, before the revolution, the culture was different, so now we have academies to promote cooperative mentality. Because in some places, there's still some pi private economy. Um, this would be an example. It's, uh, they're mostly small shops, um, sometimes run out of front of people's homes. Um, there are some larger companies that are still private. Uh, they're choosing not to take them by force at this point, but to persuade people to develop them into cooperatives. The main economic activity is agriculture, uh, although 70% of Rajava's budget right now is being spent on the war effort. Rojava is rich in natural resources. Uh, the Jazeera Canton contains most of Syria's oil. Uh, but they don't have much of a way to get it out of the ground or refine it and no one to sell it to. Turkey's willing to buy ISIS's oil on the black market, um, as is Syria. But uh, the Kurds have no one to sell their oil to. Uh, so they use it for their own purposes. So the second part of the threefold economy is the war economy. Again, 70% of their budget is spent on defense. The war costs $20 million each year. They buy, buy their own weapons, and the weapons are very expensive. The rest of the budget is used by the self-government to provide public services to finance itself. They um, finance bread, uh, diesel fuel, everything that the Syrian people need, the Kurdish people need. They have chosen uh, not to collect taxes, and so there's no fixed income. There's limited electricity, clean water, and other necessities. There are some aid organizations in the area, but the presence is mostly symbolic. 
They're not really doing anything. There's no aid coming from anyone. Um, Assad is receiving billions of dollars in humanitarian aid. None of that makes it to the Kurds. Uh, so the third area is the open economy, which is where things get really tricky because Rojava needs infrastructure and they have no way to build infrastructure. They've, they're in really desperate circumstances and they have to find a way to provide a life for their people. So the open economy is for foreign investment. It's supposed to be done under the control of the popular councils and to be socialized, to have the workers in control of the factories, um, but to do it in cooperation with um, multinational corporations, which is scary. But the people of Rojava definitely generally are, are extremely committed to uh, anti-capitalism, realize the risks of this. It's uh, just a necessary evil that they are having to take part in right now. Although at this point, there's no foreign investment. There's no infrastructure. They, they're trying to attract it, but none has come in. All right. Um, David Graeber, in an article, responded to critics who believe that Rojava revolution is not anti-capitalist enough. He talks about how uh, most resources currently are collectivized, as well as how he says roughly half the land and other resources are collectivized. Um, that the academy system is offering six week intensive courses on various forms of expertise that have previously been monopolized by the Bathis, which was a very much a rule by expert style administration. There's a conscious strategy of deprofessionalization of knowledge to prevent the emergence of a new technocrat class. Te uh, economic academies not only train in technical knowledge, but emphasize cooperative management and aim to disseminate such skills to as much of the population as possible. The aim is to connect cooperatives directly to one another so that the ultimate um, uh, ultimately, I want to eliminate the, the use of money altogether in the cooperative se sector. Uh, and key necessities are distributed free to local communes. Um, the indigenous capitalists, that, indigenous capitalists that do exist are mostly part of the bazaar system, which has been around for thousands of years. Um, and all of the trade is um, in smuggled goods, so it's not surprising. Uh, they believe that, that women themselves constitute the original proletariat, that the family was seen as the primary place of production, uh, production being primarily of people and only secondary of material wealth, reversing the idea of production, social reproduction, and women as the primary exploited class within that system. An emphasis on giving women military and weapons training is not a matter of wartime expedience. People actually insist it is a key part of how they conceive a broader anti-capitalist project for the transformation of society's production, which would make it impossible to restore a top-down capitalist economic system. He says over and over and over when he visited, uh, he heard Kurds say that you can't get rid of capitalism without getting rid of the state. Um, you can't get rid of the state without getting rid of patriarchy. So again, it's very foundational. All right, let's talk about the military a bit. Um, the, the ruling party in Rojava is the YDP. And the armed forces are the YPG and the YPJ, uh, the People's Defense Units. Uh, the YPJ is an all-women all -women military. And I should talk a bit about the police. They, they also aim to abolish the police by giving everyone, all citizens in Rojava, uh, six months of police training. So everyone's police. And in order to, and, but before they can ever touch a weapon, they have to take courses on uh, nonviolent conflict resolution as well as feminist theory. Um, so 
The YPG and YPJ are their armed wings and they've been incredibly effective in this fight. Again, most of this started after the Syrian uprising and the Syrian civil war, which we'll talk about in just a minute. This is kind of a breakdown of different Kurdish parties. Uh, this is uh, Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria, and at the top, the transnational organizations. So PKK is the first one we're interested in. HPG is their armed wing. And the YGA star is their women's armed wing. In 2005, with the Declaration of Democratic Confederalism, they formed the KCK, which is a big umbrella organization. The KJK is the um, parallel uh, women's equivalent. KCK is an uh, um, uh, umbrella organization for all affiliated PKK organizations. So the PYD is who initially took power in Rojava and thereafter instituted the social revolution. TEVDEM is an organization that uh, mobilizes people from the grassroots as well as represents the people of Rojava on the international level. The ENKS or uh, KNC is the Kurdish National Council. It has um, historically had conflicts, including armed conflicts, with the YPD. Uh, but they now have a, an alliance. The DBK mediates between them. And technically, it is supposed to be in charge of the YPJ and YPG. But in reality, they mostly just follow the orders of the YPD, or I'm sorry, the PYD. Um, so let's see, oh, other forces we should talk about. The KRG is the part, is uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. They're allowed by the Iraqi state to uh, govern themselves. Um, like I said earlier, pro-capitalism, uh, pro pro-West. Um, the two political parties that mostly make it up are the KDP, and the PUK. PUK is uh, Democratic Socialist or Social Democrat, I can never keep them straight. Organization kind of center and left, opposed to the KDB, they've, um, or at least they have been in the past. Uh, both of their fi fighting forces are known as the Peshmerga. All right, so in 2011, you have the Syrian uprising. It was believed it was gonna be just kind of a natural extension of the Arab Spring where regimes are being overthrown everywhere. Um, these are some Kurds participating in the uprising, and I believe these are Arabs. Um, so it didn't go that way. It wasn't an easy regime change. It turned into this bloody civil war, which is probably gonna go on for decades, and is really extremely complex. I stared at this for a while figuring it out. Um, so the major players of the Assad government, the de facto power, the Free Syrian Army and the Islamic Front are the main opposition groups. In addition to that, you have Islamic terrorist groups, um, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, Hezbollah, and the nation state players, the US, Iraq, Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar. And when you uh, start charting this stuff out. Um, most of it makes sense. Uh, for the most part, our allies have the same enemies as us. When I say us, I'm talking about the US government. Um, not us. Um, some of, there's some things that are a little weird. Qatar is apparently funding al-Nusra. Assad is funding ISIS a bit. Uh, but what this chart doesn't show is all of the under the table deals. This is only what governments are officially doing. Uh, so it's common knowledge that private donors in our allies, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, uh, gave most of the funding for ISIS in the first place when it was getting set up. Um, and when you start getting to the complexities of this, it becomes impossible to really tell who's supporting who and who's not. Yeah. Okay, so you said Assad was funding ISIS? Uh, he's buying their oil. 
it's like he tries to keep it secret, but it's one of these big open secrets. So, yeah, he's he he's hoping that they can help defeat the Syrian opposition forces. Um, I don't know what he plans to do after they're defeated. So, oh, and the other thing this doesn't include is the Kurds anywhere, any of their interests, which, as you saw on the last table, are a pretty complex group. Um, even the Syrian opposition itself has a lot of different factions. You've got the Free Syrian Army, who the U.S. is funding. The Islamic Front, um, as the name would imply, or Islamic Fundamentalists, want to impose Sharia law. The NCB, or NCC, is kind of a, a moderate force, which is who Rojava, who's located here, is allied with. They've been accused of being in, um, of collaborating with Assad. Basically the reason that Rojava is on their side is they don't want to fight Syria right now. They've got enough battlefronts without taking on the Syrian state. They've basically taken a position of, leave us alone, we'll leave you alone, let us run our areas, we will interfere with you. And so far that's held up. Um, yeah, that's enough on that. So this, I think, is a pretty recent updated map of who controls what in Iraq right now. The black is ISIS. Um, what did I say? Iraq. Damn it. Syria. <laughs> the black is ISIS. They control um, about a third of the land mass, um, a huge area of Iraq. The red is Assad's forces. <laughs> Shit, what did I say? God damn it. <laughs> ISIS controls a large area of Syria and Iraq. Um, the red is the Assad forces. The green is the opposition forces, which are a very complex group. And white is al-Nusra, and yellow, of course, is Kobani, is Rojava. Kobani's in the middle. All right. So, again, in, um, with the Syrian uprising, the security forces were taken out of the north of Syria to uh, fight the front down south. Uh, when they fled, uh, the bourgeoisie fled, and the YPG swept in uh, to take, take control over the area. I should also say they were reluctant to take part in the initial demonstrations against Assad or take part in the, the coalition of opposition forces because the summits were being held in Turkey, were endorsed by Turkey, and the Kurds didn't see themselves represented there. So they captured the city of Kobani on the 19th of July, 2012, which is seen as the uh, founding of the revolution. They captured Amud uh, and Afran on the 20th of July, thus entering the Syrian war. They quickly, quickly captured several cities in Jazeera on the 21st of July and took over towns, other towns in Jazeera. On the 24th of July, the YPD announced that, announced that the Syrian security forces withdrew uh, and they took control of all government institutions. This is when they established self-rule. On uh, August 2nd, 2012, the National Coordinating Com Committee for Democratic Change announced that most Kurdish-dominated Syrians cities in Syria were no longer controlled by government forces and were now governed by Kurdish political parties. Um, as they s took over control, though, they um, got into a conflict with the Free Syrian Army. The earliest incidents were on the 29th of June and 3rd of July, 2012, when they started clashing. <coughs> On October 25th, some 200 rebels moved into a Kur Kurdish-controlled city um, in Aleppo. It was the first time the government or rebel forces moved in a substantial way against the Kurdish forces. 
Uh, on the 5th of November, the YPG and the AFSA signed a truce promising the release of det detainees and a closer cooperation in the fight against Assad, the Assad government. Uh, thereafter, the main targets were uh, the Islamists. Um, is that a problematic term? Islamists? Okay. <laughs> right. Islamists? I was pronouncing it wrong. Islamists? Islamists. Okay. Islamists is perfectly acceptable. I think they're both acceptable. <laughs> I just always heard that. But neither is acceptable. <laughs> I guess you should ask people if they're Islamic. Yeah. I should. To be misrepresented. No, I'm not Islamic. Okay. But even Islamic people aren't Islamists. Hard for me to weigh in on that. All right. Well, Okay, so Al Nusra and ISIS are the main terrorist groups they're fighting against. Um, on May twenty, uh, on, or, I'm sorry, on the twenty-sixth of May, a statement entitled "Echo from Qusayr," signed by no less than twenty-one armed Islamic groups, declared the YPG traitors to the jihad. The goal, according to the statement, was a complete cleansing process of the PKK. Um, an important battle was the Battle of Ras al Ayan. Uh, by the end of the battle, the city was divided between uh, Arabs on the west and Kurdish on the east. On the evening of the 26th of July, the YPG took control of the headquarters of Al Nusra and released the fighter that Al a fighter that Al Nusra had kidnapped. On the 17th of July, Kurdish fighters expelled the jihadists from the town after a night of fighting and soon took control of the border crossing with Turkey. On the 19th of July, White PG captured the village of Tal Alo, and on the 20th of July, the White PG took control of, of a key dam previously held by the Islamists. Um, did I miss one? Oh, yeah. August, September, the several FSA brigades as well as ISIS jointly declared uh, declare the start of the siege of Kobani, which would uh, become a bigger deal than next year. The areas surrounding Kobani have since been blocked on all sides. The YPG suffered defeat when the Islamists had captured further territory from the Kurds in Aleppo. Um, Islamists were ethnically cleansing the Kurds from towns in the countryside and massacring them. YPG thereafter took control of a city after four days of fighting that killed 20 people. In October, they took control of a border crossing with Iraq, as well, well as the town itself. On the 20th of October, ISIS, the ISIS front in uh, Silaxa region completely collapsed and YPG captured villages, several villages there while remnants of ISIS forces fled to Tel Hamas and Tel Brak. November, um, the YPG continued to capture more towns from ISIS. Um, by this point, they had captured 40 towns and villages in the offensive. In November, the PYD announced plans to create an autonomous transitional government to run the Kurdish-dominated northeast of Syria, which we talked about. Um, January, February, there was an Islamist offensive and a Kurdish counteroffensive. Uh, Jihadist forces attacked the YPG in Hasaka province, uh, but their attack was repelled. They captured a tank from the Jihadists. I don't know if I got a picture of that in here. Um, mo mostly ISIS is arming themselves with American made tanks and weapons that they capture in Iraq. Uh, two days later, the YPG claimed to have killed many ISIS fighters and captured 30 of them, in addition to capturing five military vehicles and a large amount of weaponry during the ISIS operation. I should have included some pictures of uh, these homemade tanks they make out of buses and like armor plating and like paint them up like they're awesome. But I should have put a picture in. Uh, April and May, um, ISIS attacked a number of villages but were repelled. In although on the 11th of March, ISIS captured a town, attacked a hotel, 
uh, in, with suicide bombs, killing nine Kurds civilians, and executed 25 Kurds. On the 13th, ISIS captured a strategic bridge and strategic regions around Kobani. Later, uh, the YPG captured 35 ISIS fighters in the countryside of Kobani when the, the ISIS unsuccessfully la launched an attack on them. But the centerpiece of all this is the Battle of Kobani. It got a lot of international attention. Probably you guys heard some news reports about it. Um, it was really important for ISIS to take this town because, well, first of all, they've got a mandate from God and they're trying to bring on, bring on the end of the world. And it looks really bad when they get their asses kicked by a bunch of feminists. Also, it's, uh, it was strategic. If they can take Kobani, which is in the center of the three cantons, then they believed they could um, eliminate the autonomy project altogether and it would allow them access into Syria, into Turkey. So this began, this is in 2014. In March, ISIS began attacking villages but was repelled uh, initially. Later in the month, they started capturing towns. Oh, let's see. I got ahead of myself. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so ISIS came in with tanks, uh, a lot of heavy weaponry, captured grain silos, um, began seizing villages. In May, they kidnapped um, a number of uh, Kurdish people. Uh, 193 Kurdish civilians between the ages of 17 and 70. And on the same day, another 186 students who had been traveling from Kobani to complete their exams. They were reportedly sent to religious schools in Majib, where they were indoctrinated into the ideology of jihad and the Quran. In July, things got even worse for the YPG. ISIS began using uh, weapons captured from Iraq and seized several villages near Kobani after three days of fighting with YPG forces. Um, I read somewhere that it launched 3,000 mortar, mortar attacks in four days. Um, they advanced from Kobani to the east, forcing the YPG to withdraw from several villages. In, on the 14th of July, the PYD issued a regional call to arms for all Kurds to assist in defending Kobani. Kurdish militants from the PKK were traveling from Turkey to reinforce the YPG defensive positions. And by this time, at least 10 villages had fallen to ISIS. By the end of July, according to the YDP, ISIS offensive against Kobani had been repelled, with 685 ISIS fighters being killed. Um, you can see. Uh, this is the first instance of the YPG using uh, anti-tank weaponry. Um, these are a group of snipers. They look pretty badass. Uh, this is an incident that took place on the um, on July 19th, I think, the second anniversary of uh, the Rojava Revolution, when Kurds from both sides of the border of Turkey and Syria met at the border crossing. Turkey wasn't going to let them through, but they ended up tearing down the fence and a thousand people traveled in to help in the fight against Kobani anyway. In September, they, the YPG suffered a lot of losses. They lost a strategic bridge of the Euphrates. Um, ISIS was using tanks, rockets, artillery. Uh, within 24 hours, captured 21 Kurdish vi villages and left Kobani completely encircled by ISIS forces. Um, two days later, they, ISIS captured 39 more villages, bringing their force within 20 kilometers of Kobani. By the 21st, they kept, it captured 64 villages, and the forces came within 10 kilometers. And by the 20th of September, the ISIS militants captured uh, several more villages. At this time, the YPG mer uh, merged with the Peshmerga forces from Iraq and began to turn the tide of the battle. 
Although an ISIS initially succeeded in capturing 350 Kurdish villages and towns, which generated a wave of 3,000 displaced Kurds who fled across the border to Turkey. The Peshmerga forces, with the aid of the PYD, took control of the border crossing between the two countries, which marked the first major battle to straddle both. In October, the Peshmerga forces crossed into Syria from Turkey to aid in the defense of Kobani. <coughs> Oh, sorry. Yeah, so when you said the YPG uh, joined with the Peshmerga forces, if I understand your lecture correctly, the Peshmerga forces were the Social Democratic forces in northern Iraq, is that correct? Um, not entirely. It's, it's also the KDP, um, who's the conservative pro-West party. Right, but the both of capital, the pro-capitalist. Yeah, bo both of their forces are called the Peshmerga, okay, and they're right, part they of the same government. with that YPG, which was mm -hmm. a radical, mm -hmm. like... Communalist forces. So that's what happened. I'm just trying to make sure I understand yeah. how the forces are merging. And you might want to repeat the question and then give a simple answer. Just oh. you have the mic and I don't. Okay. You were uh, asking about the Peshmerga forces and their ideology. Or joining um, with the YPG. Joining with the YPG. And yeah, the Peshmerga forces are largely part of the. Uh, KGD, Kurdish, Democratic. KDG, Kurdish Democratic government. I think so. So they're 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 a they're a mixed group ideologically. I mean they've got parties that are um, pro capitalist, parties that are social democrat. Um, but in this case, they came to assist, uh, and um, and the attack from ISIS. Uh, the, the relationships between the two were really strained up to that point, um, and even a little after that with the, um, the Pesmerg forces digging, digging a large trench to prevent uh, movement between uh, Iraq and Syrian Kurdistan. Uh, but later when uh, the YPG forces again assisted them in a battle, um, relations improved. But by January, the, it was revealed that 40,000 Kurds in total had fled to Turkey. But the YPG, in coordination with the Euphrates Volcano Joint Operations Room in the effort to, to counter the ISIS offensive, were later joined by the Free Syrian Army reinforcements, heavily armed Peshmerga and regional, uh, Kurdistan regional government, and with the uh, frequent American and Arab airstrikes providing air support. And on the 26th of January 2015, the YPG, along with the FSA and Peshmerga reinforcements and continued U.S.-led coalition airstrikes, allowed the defenders of Kobani to retake the city, driving ISIL into a steady res retreat. The city of Kobani was fully recaptured on the 27th of January. Kurdish militia, along with allied Arab armed groups backed by further airstrikes, then made rapid adv advances into rural Kobani, with ISIL withdrawing 25 miles away from the city, uh, by the 2nd of February, and by April, it is lost, ISIS had lost almost all of its villages that it captured in the Canton. So that was a, um, a really dire situation and a really heroic resistance. Another important one was the Yazidis who were stuck on Mount Sinjar, starving to death for, I think, more than a month. Um, surrounded by ISIS forces. Eventually the YPG was able to open a humanitarian corridor and allow them to escape. So despite being heavily outgunned, outfunded, outmanned, having little to no resources of their own, they've managed to survive and um, without compromising the character of their revolution. Um, I had some other things I was going to talk on, but I think I'll just open up to questions here. Maybe you should go more of what you wanted to talk on, because my questions are somewhat short. <laughs> well, I was going to talk about uh, 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 potential problems, foreign investment, um, collaborating with the U.S., uh, with the airstrikes, um, some of the anarchist criticism of it, but... Well, actually, I have a totally different criticism of okay. that thing. Um, I forget his name. 
Starts with a C, I think. The main dude you mentioned multiple times. Oslan? Oslan. Sorry, I just remember the Slan. Um, yeah, so Oslan has a Marxist Leninist ideology, and he holds the Marxist Leninist uh, ideology for multiple decades until he's captured. How is that fundamentally different from Gonzalo in Peru, who held a Marxist Leninist Maoist ideology up until he was captured? And then it became more expedient to adopt an ideology that was more receptive uh, or at least more palatable to the state. Okay, so the question was, Ocelon only changed his uh, political orientation after he was captured. Um, how's that different than Peru, which I don't really Gonzalo. know anything about. Gun Gonzalo? Gonzalo. Chairman. Gonzalo. Um, Chairman of nothing. Who <laughs> was trying to... Um, adopt an ideology that was more palatable in line with to the, state. To the he, state. Like he literally said, we need global people's war. And then he got arrested and he's like, what we should do is run elections. I mean, okay. I'm not, I'm, it, it's more complicated than that, but it's not a lot more complicated than that. Well, Ocelon uh, was expressing uh, doubts about the theory before he was captured. He had that quote on that uh, satellite TV interview when he said that um, many of his forces are, are uh, no better than murderers. Um, basically, he'd been fighting this war for 25 years and had gotten no closer to the society he wanted with tens of thousands of casualties, a lot of atrocities. So I think those doubts started well before he was imprisoned. Um, I don't see how it's uh, the the character of this revolution is is more palatable to anyone really. That's been one of the main criticisms of um, from the anarchist side is that these are just these are still just authoritarian Stalinist Marxists. We can't support them because of this. They've just they've just <laughs> they've just adopted this ideology to court support from the West. Which Graeber's response to that is so. They want to appear more friendly to foreign powers, so they pretend to be anarchists, of all things. Like, why wouldn't you pretend to be Islamists? Why, why wouldn't you pretend to be liberals? Why wouldn't you pretend to be anything that actually gets you money and guns? I don't see how this particular form of revolution um, gives them any advantage that way, but I might be wrong. So the way you kind of explain things in this my confusion is it wasn't exactly let's go with the ruling party of the other state. It's once what you refer to as the Syrian uprising happened and the ruling class sort of advocated, they just played kind of speakers. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. It was not yeah, it wasn't a, a traditional revolution that way. They didn't have to violently overthrow the bourgeoisie. They had this ideology, they had uh, you know, Oslan had, had issued that um, Declaration back in 2005, um, so I was seven years previously. Prior to that, they were Marxist-Leninists. Um, so they they kind of had these aims in place. It was just kind of circumstances that gave them the opportunity just to take over the land without a lot of fighting. See, you, Kevin. Were you saying bye? So I guess for me, this is kind of a one in the same question. This might be a different question um, in your opinion. Uh, so, you know, kind of like Chris mentioned, like they just kind of left and then like, they're like, oh, you left this factor here, it's ours now. Um, how do you think that, um, I guess I'll just formulate this as actually a single question. How do you think that, uh, is there gonna be like more unique challenges and how do you think they're gonna deal with this particularly? Because um, you mentioned that they're not even necessarily wanting to go after <coughs> the special forces, which makes sense. You know, you might, sorry, I was very own blink. Uh, you mentioned that they don't want to go after certain larger businesses to take them by force, to collectivize them by force, um, which makes sense somewhat in the context. Um, but so, what do you, do you think? What kind of new challenges? And how do you think they're going to? Do you think they're going to be able to deal with them well when the if the situation occurs where the bourgeois can return and they're like, "Hey, we want this back," and they start, you know, doing their thing to get it back? Yeah, it's really unpredictable at this point because there's so many different. Uh, factions fighting and there can be so many different results. Um, I mean that's one possible one that Assad returns to power and um, at a point like hey give us our shit back. 
um, but at which point they wouldn't they would no longer be fighting um, ISIS or Al Nusra or the opposition forces, and uh, I think they've they've shown themselves to be um, extremely uh, effective fighters. So, so, they, so they just killed them. But, I mean, sorry. Um, so like basically, what you're saying rather is that like. Because I guess what I'm seeing, like, you know, with a lot of this is, like, these are really creative ways to handle, like, you know, internal conflicts, unite people towards, like, fighting an enemy. Um, in the case of the bourgeois coming back and creating division, um, you know, like, you know, funding or propping up X group or, like, funding a founding of political party. You know, just doing the kind of things that historically, like, the ruling class has done to remain in power. The answer then is to kill them. But I'm, like, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but, I mean... <laughs> I think, yeah, I mean, I think uh, in the in the situation of um, Assad taking power, which I would be really surprised if this situation resolved itself in the next few years. But if that did happen and uh, Assad did retake power and um, wanted to uh, push back into Kamani, I'm sure there would be violent resistance. Well, I, I'm not necessarily saying like. Uh, the Syrian government. I'm saying like a situation of relative stability comes over that region that's okay. under control. And then so, so even if the opposition forces factory, win, people used to own the factory. Mm -hmm. Turn and say we want the factory back. And obviously, I'll say that was the party made an insurgency. Maybe they. Yeah, I, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't read anything on on anyone from Gumani talking about that situation. But my assumption would be that they would um, resist any attempt to take back the land or factories. That that's in service of the people, and it's going to stay that way. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like there's a, a unique character moving forward that has produced the successes of the Kurdish people um, now compared to its past? Because somebody might make the argument, and I don't know if this is a good argument. So I, I literally have no dog in that fight, but. Um, some might just say that there's a confluence in history that makes it so the Kurdish people are more successful, not due to any sort of political differences or changes that they've made over the last 30 years. And in fact, maybe the argument can be made that they won, they could win more, or maybe that they won less. Uh, what, what are some of your thoughts on that? I mean, because it, it seemed like the presentation kind of focused on a lot on the history and about some of the things that they were doing different politically. But I, I don't really see a synthesis between those two saying, well, there were these changes politically which allowed them to alter, like say for instance, their forces or something like that and win more. Um, and I'm not saying that that's not the case or that is the case. I just want to know what your insights are on that. Uh, so to reframe the question, um, what unique characteristics do you see any political change that made it so they won more or less, or is it just historically this weird confluence of events that allows them to have these these pockets of military victories? Okay, so is, is it politics or just circumstances that have allowed them to be effective? Um, I'd say both. I mean, if suddenly all the police and the military and all the rich people just ran out of Utah, and we could just like be like, this is... For all of us now, it'd be pretty fucking easy. So, like, that's a situation that's that's uh, really in their favor. Um, but when it comes to the actual resistance against uh, the opposition forces and against the Islamists, I think their political character has really informed their um, their strategy and made them more effective. Um, we'll see the, the principle of autonomy. Um, I don't know if I mentioned, but the, all the military forces are completely democratic. They elect their own office, officers. And they and all of the brigades act pretty much independently, which allows them to adapt really quickly on the battlefield. Um, so, I guess that would be an example of their um, politics making them a, a a more effective force. Did I answer your question? It does. Okay. Cool. I'm wondering. Um what, what do you think made the United States want to get involved in like the defense of Kobani? Like, I um, think the United States could have just sat back, let ISIS take the city, you know, and then bomb ISIS elsewhere and make us feel good about ourselves. You know. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, do you think, do you think okay. there's something politically 
Mm. I don't know, kind of like something palatable about that style of revolution to the West, or do you think that there is some sort of popular pressure that forced the United States' hand, or do you think that the United States is really all that committed to the force to fight ISIS that they would like help, help out a bunch of anarchists? Yeah, well, the, um, when the, the U.S. first really got involved, involved was on the, the Mount Sinjar situation. And I know I heard tons and tons of coverage of that and very sympathetic accounts of these Yazidis who are dying horrible deaths on this mountain in the long, ongoing way. And uh, I think that's what the U.S. responded to initially. Um, the YBG in that case was fighting alongside of Peshmerga forces that are friendly to the U.S. and others. So um, that was a safer bet for them. Um, as far as Kobani, I guess it would just be um, their opposition to, to ISIS in the first place. I mean, the, the only reason they um, finally started airstrikes in Iraq in, uh, against ISIS was to you know, protect their oil interests when ISIS started getting too close. So I think it's, it's probably just an extension of that. Um, just generally want to defeat ISIS for their own purposes. I don't think they really care much about the YPG. It's my personal opinion, but these, that's just all speculation. I really don't know. Um, do you think that the preeminence of women is part of the anarchist ideology, or do you think it is a historical and social uh, artifact of the PKK, which instill like the dual leadership system of men and women. Um, I guess I sh should have uh, read more about the history of um, women in the PKK before that to be able to really answer that question well. Um, I know I, I I've seen some evolution uh, of these parties over time. I um, can't remember which, which council it was. One of the PKK-affiliated Kurdish parties. Well, the P um, PKK itself went from 100% men to 53% uh, women. I didn't know that. So yeah, yeah that might be it. Um, it's, um, I, I, somewhere in my research, I, I, I read a quote saying that um, the, the Kurdish women weren't given anything. They took all the power for themselves. Osalan had this uh, commitment to uh, feminism, to dismantling of patriarchy, and he proposed these systems, but they wouldn't have come about if the, if the Kurdish women hadn't um, actually taken them out, started organizing uh, for their own power. Um, but if it's like you say that the PKK went from 100% male to 53% uh, female, that's that would show that there's a um, definitely a historical precedent there. I don't know if that's due to the the character of the Kurdish people or um, radical politics generally, or just Osalan. I'm not sure. That's that's worth further investigation for sure. Um, you mentioned a lot about um, that Osalon in prison mm -hmm. switched from Marxism Leninism to uh, Bookchin's style of communalism. Was that like a change that was adopted by the whole PKK? Or? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't read anyone who was ab about any PKK affiliated parties who were resistant to that. Um, Osalon is still uh, very much loved. Uh, when you look at uh, uh, pictures from Ojava and, and videos with uh, um, interviews with the people in Rojava. You see pictures of Osalan everywhere. They still carry him on uh, flags and banners and patches. And um, he's uh, extremely respected. So even though he's not really the one issuing orders anymore, he's still seen as a, a, a central ideological leader. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't hear of any parties that broke away to like remain Marxist-Leninist. I know there are still Marxist-Leninist parties 
in uh, or Kurdish parties in uh, in Turkey. I don't think they're on this. Table, unless they're one of those on the right that I don't really know. So there still are Marxist Leninist Kurdish resistance groups. But. Yeah, the Turkish state decided to bomb them when they were fighting ISIS. The Turkish state was bombing them when they were fighting ISIS? Yes. Wow. Yeah, I didn't. I was. I only really read about the situation in Turkey up to the capture of Ocelon. Um so I know about that, but yeah, I, I don't know about anyone that was really resistant to the change. Um, so I know that in Turkey also around this, there's been a lot of rioting, um, especially in like very heavily populated Kurdish areas and parts of Istanbul. Um, and I guess like uh, the main thing that I would look at is, um, you know, the so there's the PKK like youth groups who are doing a lot of this, like the organizing of it, of these demonstrations and stuff, sending a lot of fighters. Um, but they have like an extremely close relationship, at least it, it would appear, um, with like groups like the PHKPC, um, and you know all kinds of other like very heavily Marxist-Leninist groups within Turkey. So I guess my question is like, um, how like in what way has that like played out, um, or has it even? Um, it's you know because especially I know that like the, I can't remember the name of the party. That's why I'm kind of mumbling a little bit because I'm trying to remember it. Um, but yeah, so I know that like there's been a lot of like communication between them and a lot of collaboration. Um, like, it, so like, have, did you like see anything interesting in like the way that like the parties that are still in Turkey um, that are very much like Marxist Leninists have been working with um, the YPG and YPJ? Um, I didn't read anything about reports of that might be going on. I um, was after like the year two thousand. I pretty much concentrated on the situation in Syria, so I'm very unaware of what happened in, what's been happening in Turkey lately. Um, it might be the case they're collaborating, but I, I haven't heard anything about it. We, no, I mean, I asked because I know they've been sending like a lot of, oh. all these groups have been sending fighters to Syria. Um, and so I thought it was interesting, maybe like it's just like show international solidarity, or if it's like specifically like a, you know, cooperating effort. Likely, it's um, yeah. The the as as many divisions as there are among the Kurds now, it's actually never really been more united. In uh, in uh, ancient Kurdistan, like it was said that uh, no Kurdish person could speak for anyone uh, beyond their local band because it was so decentralized and uh, so spread apart. Um, but even through all of these these conflicts, it's it's re reached a point um, of unity that it hasn't been at before, and there's been a lot of um, ethnic solidarity crossing political lines and international borders to um, aid in the fight against ISIS. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. So, what drew you to this topic, and what do you think the most important lesson? draw from your lectures? Um, what drew me initially was that uh, that Graeber article. Um, I'm, I'm interested in uh, any way of um, any model of uh, overthrowing capitalism and establishing a, a free and equal society and this is just a really uh, really unique attempt at it. Um, a lot of the, you know, I, I read a lot of anarchist theory, but there's not a lot of places where it's really being put into action in a in a real way, and this is one of them. So I guess just the takeaway would be, um, there's more than one way to skin a capitalist. <laughs> um, there's a, um, I, I believe a, a socialist revolution with a with a deep commitment to anti-authoritarianism and to direct, direct democracy is is viable. It's a black cat. It's a white cat. As long as it catches a capitalist. <laughs> <laughs>